believe that he is everything to you. We're so happy to be back in the house. I want to say thank you to everyone that's in the house today. We have made some adjustments. want to say make some noise for our sound team back there in the back. They did a phenomenal job. I mean, you all can do better than that. I think you need to stand to your feet and make some noise for our sound team. Everybody stand to your feet and make some noise for our sound team. Just give it to them one good time. Tell them that we appreciate it. Everybody, come on, make some Y'all can do better than that. For the sound team, make some noise for them. They're doing a phenomenal job. Thank you all. We had some technical difficult. We had some technical situations in the back, and you all know that the last few weeks I've said that I'm going to force myself. God is forcing me to scratch myself, and He's forcing me to scratch our leadership team. And so sometimes I find myself still trying to get in certain things, but I promised myself that I would not try to learn the new things that we have back in the sound. Don't y'all like the lights and have everything look? Worship just goes to a whole new level. God has allowed us to. A little bit on the floor monitor. You can turn them down just a little bit. God has allowed us to increase in the midst of COVID-19. And it is proof that God is with a house anytime you see that other churches or other locations or other businesses are closing their door, doors. And God is allowing us to expand. And so I find myself still trying to put my hand in certain things. But in the back, we had some situations. And I found myself trying to get things together. And the Holy Spirit reminded me and said, I thought you stated that you were going to allow people to grow. So I had to walk away, still trying to figure out what's going on. But in the midst of everything that's taking place, God is putting the right people in place that's doing things for us. Sound team, make some noise for the worship team. Hasn't they went, they have went to a whole new level. Worship, I mean, worship is phenomenal. Um, our, our helps team, our security, everyone who's putting a hand into making our service happen. I just want to say that I'm really, really thankful that you, have, that you are taking this house very serious. Even though we are not at full capacity in the house, I'm just so thankful that we do have the doors open. So everybody online say the doors are now open officially. Type it in in the message line so the doors are now open. We have made sure that we have put the proper things in place. I don't have my clicker. We are making sure that we put the proper things in place to make sure that you and your family are safe when you come in here. We have proper social distancing. We shouldn't have families that's not together, that's together in the house. We want to make sure that you keep yourself at the proper distance according to our city to make sure that we all stay safe in the midst of COVID-19. So let's go to my next slide. Even though I'm waiting on my clicker, I know our sound team is going to get to me really quickly here. Let's go to our confession. Let's say our confession together here before I get started. Y'all ready? Let's go. One, two, three, let's go. Father, help me to keep focus on you, making you the center of my life. Everything else will fall into place if I seek you first. All righteousness will surely be added unto me. I am your faithful follower. Body, get in line. You are not the mind, and you are not in control. Father, help me to take responsibility for every thought to clear my mind of doubt, fear, worry, sadness, despair, lust, temptation, envy, jealousy, malice, pride, and anything that breaks your heart. Amen. Amen. Becoming a better person daily as you walk with me in Jesus' name. And if you believe that, make some noise for our king. So let me set my clicker here for about two hours and 30 minutes because I know y'all are hungry for the word. Let me set my timer here so we can get right into the word. Are y'all ready to eat? Have y'all been enjoying the masterpiece? Have y'all been enjoying the masterpiece? If you really enjoyed it, there was, there was a week say yes. If you in, if you really been biting and eating away at, at masterpiece, the masterpiece teaching, I want you to make some noise for the king. That's what I'm talking about. Make some noise for the king. Very good. So let's jump right into it here. We can go to my next slide until we, okay, there we go. So the masterpiece teaching, I've taken the last few weeks just to make sure that I can, that I can teach in reference to the, import, the importance of us becoming God's masterpiece. Because we all are not finished, we all are not the finished product that God has allowed, that God really wants us to be in this moment. Sometime in the midst of chaos, in the midst of social injustice, in the midst of all the things that's taking place, we can begin to look outwardly more than we look in. And if we take our time to start looking inwardly, God will allow us to clean up some things before he's able to show us and display our lives to the world. And so sometimes we can look so far on the outside and be so distracted by everything this week. Just like I was distracted this week to find out what's the lady's name that um, the lady's name that um, that bribed her child to go to college. Right. Do y'all what's her name? I can't think of a name. What's her name? 
Maury Laughlin. So she bribed the college so her child would go to to go to college. Yeah, that name. <laughs> and end up what's wrong? Oh, I got you. Okay. So she ended up bribing the con the institution to allow her child to come into school. And so certain things happened. My mama told me not to use this word no more, but I can't say pissed off in church no more, so I'm not going to say it. Certain things really make you upset when you see it. And so when I saw the fact that it, they allowed her, the judge said that you get a chance to choose the jail of your kind <laughs> to serve your two-month sentence. And I wonder, what if that was one of us? And so sometimes those things that take place in our society can become a distraction in reference to what God wants us to do personally and physically in the house of God. And so when I see these things, so that's one thing I saw this week. The second thing I saw this week was Dr. C and I, I may have mentioned it this week to our leadership team, but we were watching a TV show that comes on late at night. I can't think of the show, but it had these three or four people that was talking about uh, relationships and things like that. And so they had this one lady on there that claimed to be a person that knew the word of God. She was trying to show her book, and she claimed to be a person who knew the word of God. But then she was, a, sometimes, you know, certain people are bad examples for the church. Don't y'all believe that? So she began to explain the reason why the Old Testament had multiple wives and all these things that took place. But then they asked him, they said, well, she said, well, it's definitely a sin to, you know, ha to have to adultery and fornication. And she went through all the things. She was only spitting the Bible. She didn't know how to translate the Bible to a level of understanding so that the people that don't understand the Bible can really receive it. And so she began to explain. And so one lady was on here and she had... She, she was bragging that she had been married for 25 years. Listen to me. I've been married to my same husband for 25 years, and then my second marriage, I've been married to him for eight years. And so I began to say, well, you don't have, you don't have a right to speak towards marriage either because of the situation you're in. And so the lady began to tell her that she didn't have a right to speak to marriage, but she said, uh-uh, you got me wrong. My first marriage was 25 years. I just got a second husband. So all of us stay in the same house at the same time, and now we have to keep it real because this is how marriage should work because the church stuff, the Christian stuff, it doesn't work. And so the lady, started, the lady that was representing the church, she started going back and forth, and then the lady said, well, well, let me ask you something. I have two husbands. How many times have you been divorced? The lady said, well, I've been divorced three times. I'm just like, you are representing the church. So what this made me realize is that more people in this moment that are not even the masterpieces that God has designed, designed for, they are speaking louder than the church is. And if we are not speaking loud from our platform and recognizing and realizing that God has chosen all of us to be a masterpiece for his will, then we are missing the mark why God has chosen us in this moment. Because to be honest with you, anytime God allows chaotic situations to happen in a city, He's looking for his church to be innovative. He's looking for his people to be innovative in these moments because if we're not innovative, God gives us a certain amount of time. I said this last week. God gives, a cert gives us a certain amount of kairos with a K time to take control and to allow our voices to be heard than the ignorant voices that are speaking right now. The word says that when people are, when the righteous are in place, then the people rejoice. But when the evil one is in place, then the people mourn. So what can we do in this moment? The thing that we have to do as a church is to make sure that we get out and vote. I believe this upcoming election is one of the most important elections ever. I was listening to a pastor teach this past week. He was saying, you know, this particular election reminds me of the time when people had a chance to vote on Jesus the Barabbas or Jesus the Christ. They end up choosing the evil, the evil one to stay and to have his freedom, but end up crucifying the one who can give us deliverance. So now my people. My people in the church, if we don't take full responsibility to, to at least vote this upcoming election, we are leaving it up to the society to build a community that our children will not be wanted in. So it's important for us to make sure that we can take a stance to do certain things for ourselves and for our church. And so now this moment of the season that God has me in as a pastor 
is that our city has to know us and the people that are connected to us, we have to be able to have some type of conviction that there is something that we should be doing in our city versus just coming in church, having church, hallelujah, amen, you got vegetable oil all over your face and then you walk out and you are nothing in the world system. If you're at least going to have vegetable oil on your head, at least go out with some power. If we anoint you, you all have been anointed. But in order for you to realize that you're anointed, I need everybody to realize this. The reason why I'm teaching masterpieces is because I want everyone in the church to realize and to see themselves the way God sees you. If you can see yourself the way God sees you, it doesn't matter about the haters anymore. Those that want those that don't want you to succeed, they're always going to be there. But your time to pay attention to them will not always be there. So sometimes we have to allow those that don't like us to elevate, to, to elevate us to another level. But I want every person in this church, I want you to pause for a second to say, I need to start seeing myself the way God sees me. Say it to yourself. I want you to see yourself that I am acceptable. Say it. I am acceptable. So it doesn't matter what environment I go in. Don't allow people to hold your past over your head. I don't care what you've done in the past. It don't matter if you smoke dope, you smoke weed now. God will accept you right now. You are lovable. Say, I am lovable. I am forgivable. There is grace in the kingdom of God. It's not sloppy grace, but there is grace. So if I mess up, then the church should be a place to walk and come through and say, listen, I messed up this week. Listen, I, I know that I tried to avoid Big Bertha, but I couldn't. She smelled too good this week. You know what? I, I messed up. So how do we come to the church and come to a level of forgiveness and then know that my, my forgiveness that I receive in the house is still ignites me to still achieve the purpose that God has for me? Because a masterpiece, it doesn't look great from the beginning. It's a process that it has to go through, but it's really up to the artist that has the paintbrush in his hand to orchestrate the final work. So you have to realize that if I'm in a church, I am valuable. Say, I am valuable. That means that it doesn't matter what people say you used to be. You are just as valuable as the CEO in your company. You are just as valuable as the pastor in the church. You are just as valuable as the archwright bishop the third. You are just as valuable as me. But you have to realize that God has given me this platform, but your pulpit is where God has you planted it. You are capable. Say, I am capable. I am capable to do everything. You have to make sure then in order to be the masterpiece that I clear my canvas to allow God to have the right capacity in my life so that I can achieve everything that he has for me. Does that make sense? So my culture code of the day is this. What is the difference between the man standing there in the meadow and the cow feeding by his side? Think about this for a moment. I give you quotes or questions to make you think. Sometimes people think that I think all week long. My mind is pressed all week long. But when I come to church, I park my brain so I can just be fulfilled. No, we need people that can be critical thinkers in the church too as well. We need people that can be strategic thinkers in the church even more than in your business or in your job. So think about this for a moment. What's the difference between the man standing there in the meadow and the cow feeding by his side? Check this out. In the one instance, the cow has eyes and ears, but sees nothing except the grass it is eating and hears nothing but the, the inarticulate bellowing of other cattle. That means that inarticulate means they don't have a way to express themselves. They are distracted by the things that they see. They can see no farther than that. And they are comfortable with everybody else holding their head down, every other cow holding his head down, chewing, because that's all they are meant to do. But check this out. Whereas the man lifts up his eyes and sees her far from beautiful hills and the enchanting landscape and listens to and appreciates the babbling of the little book that runs at his feet. That means that a man has a chance to really appreciate the masterpiece of the world that God has put together. When you understand the kingdom more and everything has a purpose, you don't even want to step on an ant no more. 
Sometimes I'm still praying. If y'all can fast for me and pray for me and ask me and, and pray for pray to God and ask God why and what is the purpose of the Texas mosquito? I don't get it. Because I kill them every time, but everything has a purpose. But I haven't found out what's the purpose of it. I'm like, Moses, God told you to take two by two. Why do you kill the mosquitoes? We could have been done with this in the past. Y'all think Texas mosquitoes, have you been to Mississippi? They mosquitoes look like flies. No, I'm not Moses. Oh, Noah, I'm sorry. Moses had a chance to as well, but he kept them. When they, when they, when they sent the plague, he could have had the plague to kill all mosquitoes and left them in Egypt. I'm just playing. Okay, check this out. So as the man lifts up his eyes and sees afar off the beautiful hills and the enchanting landscape and listens to and appreciates the babbling of the little brook that runs at his feet, man has always endowed by the creator with eyes to see. Eyes to see physically, but also eyes to see spiritually. In these moments, we, not only, we don't only need eyes to see physically, we need eyes to see spiritually. So this is key. A lot of people now are afraid of what's taking place with COVID-19. They're afraid to come to church, but you go to the grocery store. What's the difference? I don't get it. It's more people, more, more germs all over the baskets. Why you can't come here to a place where you can get your healing? So we are so afraid to where we're not seeing anything spiritually. But what I came to tell you today is this. That those that see with their spiritual eyes will get more on top and ahead of the game than those that are sitting and waiting on the government to tell them what to do. Check this out. He has ears to hear. He has physical ears. But how are your spiritual ears? Are you spending the right time to listen to the Father? Because the only way that you can become a masterpiece for the king is you have to be able to listen to him properly. There's a distinguished gift of listening to my voice, the enemy's voice, and what the Spirit is saying to me. So us as a church, we have to be so, oh, I feel the Holy Spirit now. We have to be so in line and in tune. What is your frequency? What frequency are you tuned into? Are you tuned into the frequency of what God is saying to us at this moment? Are you tuned into the frequency of what God is telling us to do for our children at this moment? It says, ears to hear and the mind to appreciate the beauty and the utility of that which surrounds him. Not only the physical, but in the humans, we shall be able to look through the scars of any human and see that there is glory in their life. So us as a church, we don't have the responsibility of judging someone else's life. We have the responsibility of telling them that the stuff that you went through is to help you stand on top of your glory so that your scars, you can be, you, you don't have to be afraid to show your scars to the world because somebody else will have those same scars. And if you're afraid to show those scars, the people that are hiding them will not receive deliverance because you are hiding your testimony. So in this moment, the man has a chance to see this. The human beings are God's greatest achievement. Whatever we're in, I want to help you out, folks. If you want to be successful, invest in people. I'm going to say this again because some of y'all may have missed it. If you ever want to be successful, invest in God's people. Whatever business you start, it should be something that invests in people. Because people are God's greatest investment. It's called human capital. If you put yourself in, in position to always add value to someone else's life, then God will always put you in position to receive the wealth that he needs so that you can always be in position to add value to people's life. Listen to me. He sees, man sees the flow of God's creation and how in harmony it all flows for the good of those who observe with their hearts. So when I think about this picture here, I think about an artist constructing a masterpiece. Have we ever paused for a minute to think who is, who is important to this artist? This artist has the power to create everything or anything. See, this is how God responds to us. He places the masterpiece in us, but the action of creating the masterpiece is in our hands. Genesis 1.26 states this, let us give who dominion? Let us give man dominion over the earth, over everything. So the power of the stroke is in your hand. 
You can create any life that you want. It's just that society has told you you can't have that life. So now you are battling in your mindset versus what society has told you that you can't have, but you're not coming to church so we can give you the truth. And the truth comes from you being able to sit in a place that's going to give you something that you can chew on every single day. See, an artist can pick any color, any type of brush. You have brushes that are made out of horsetails. You have brushes that are made out of carpet. You have brushes that are made out of different types of material. You have some artists that know how to use yarn and make masterpieces. But what brush do you use for the life that God has granted you in this moment? But we must always remember our purpose. And the reason why we operate in our purpose is to avoid drifting. In the moment of time, when we miss coming to the house of God or miss tuning in to what God is asking us to do, we all would tend to drift. If we're not locked to our purpose and we are going through the motions of just waking up every day, allowing us to be stuck in the house, allowing ourselves to feel like we're stuck in the house and not making changes, even I had to change in my routine today. Some of my leaders came, they saw me here early. I usually just don't come in until maybe 1030. But I'm here because God has allowed me to have a church and a building for a reason. And we can't take what God do for us for granted. We have to be thankful for the things that God has given us now and make sure that we manage it properly because God is watching and the world is watching how we take care of the things that God gives us. So what is it that God has given you right now that you haven't formulated into a masterpiece because you're going through the motions? So I came to press upon the house of God. I came to press on the people that's in this city to say that the power of the stroke is in your hand. You can paint the life you want. You can have the job you want. You can have the mate you want. You can have the business you want. Your children can listen to you, but you have to be able to say that God has given me all power in my hand. But what's connected to my hand is my mind, which is connected to the spirit of God. Listen to me. So when I think of an artist constructing this masterpiece, have we ever paused to think who is important? To the artist at this moment. He has to think of five things. He has to think of the audience. Write these down. He has to think about. What's going to be the projected thoughts. Of this audience. What is going to be the expected emotions. Of this audience. What's going to be the afterthoughts. Of this audience. And what's going to be their response. Once they see this masterpiece. So why did I put audience number one? Because all of us have been built for a certain audience. Now let's work this backwards. If I'm in the wrong audience or in the wrong purpose, then that response is not going to be the response that I need to keep moving. Right. Their afterthoughts about me will not be the right thoughts that's going to motivate me. Their expected emotions will be completely different because I'm out of a line. And then their projected thoughts are going to not be the right way. So every masterpiece, depending on its positioning in the museum, can be less valued because it's not in the right position. Oh, y'all not getting me. If I take the most valuable piece of art and I put it in a dark room without the right lighting, the value of it, when the appraisers come, can be a lot less because they miss it. they're missing certain things or certain curves in the art that the art is really meant for people to see from a different eye. So if you're not in the right position with the right light, then you can be devalued by the people that's around you. But this is key as well. If you already know that you are a valuable piece of masterpiece and you're a valuable masterpiece, it don't matter about the crowd because I already know I'm valuable. Right, right. So when I think about this picture here, in the mindset of the artist, he already knows that this masterpiece is valuable despite the audience, despite the crowd. So the reason why you come to the house of God is so that we can let you know that you are valuable before you go into the world system. It doesn't matter what you look like now. You can just be a white piece of canvas, but we have to keep encouraging you and pouring to you what God has for your life. So when I step out, 
I know that my encouragement is already in my life. And it doesn't matter what the haters say. It doesn't matter what they, they say I used to be. It doesn't matter what they say I used to do. But right now, you have to look at my life because I am a masterpiece in progress. Say I'm a masterpiece in progress. So sometimes when you are a masterpiece in progress, you see people, they stand and just look at your life. Some people have to stand and look at your life like this painting before they can really appreciate it. Sometimes we can be offended or feel like we're being overlooked, but we're simply being watched. When people are watching my life, they are evaluating my life. It's not that I'm being overlooked. Sometimes God just sits and evaluates our life. It doesn't mean that we're being overlooked. We just are being evaluated. Because sometimes it takes people to watch your life for a while before they really can appreciate your life. And we have to realize that as long as I am allowing my life to be watched, there are a lot of people watching the process of my life because God wants them to realize something out of my life. So let's go to Ephesians 2, 14 through 15 for y'all think that I don't have no scriptural content at all. It states this, the Messiah has made things up between us so that we now together on this, both non-Jewish outsiders and Jewish, Jewish insiders, he tore down the wall. We used to keep up each other at a distance. He repealed the law code that had become so clogged with fine print and footnotes that it hindered more than the help. So Christ came to tear down the wall of us thinking that somebody else is more superior than us or that other individuals are more powerful than us or that other individuals' life is better than ours. But the value of your life is not dictated by how much is in your bank account. Because money is easy to get. But the value and the way you think of yourself is harder to get. Because for so long, us as a people, us as a church, not color, not black and white, but us as a church as a whole, when we, people looked at us, they look at us and say, ah, oh, that's just a church board. But do you know what a church board really means? If you are in your job and nobody else is a church boy, that means you are the highest ranking official in that company. <laughs> Why is that? Because God says that I have given you the keys. I have given you the secrets. So when I went back to my first passage about the difference of the man and the cow, man has eyes to see. So that means that if I'm locked to hearing the Holy Spirit, if I'm in my job, there was a situation that needs to take place and you are the problem solver. Right. Jesus selected all of his disciples. Why? Because they were problem solvers. So in the church, you have to learn how to become a problem solver. Listen to this. Then he started over. Why did he start over? Because the old way was a divide between a people. There was a divide to say this amount of people, you're going to live a great life. This amount of people, you're going to serve them to make sure that they uphold their life. But Jesus Christ broke all that down. So why are we in a church putting up walls and thinking that we're better than others when we shouldn't be thinking like that? Right. Just because I came before you doesn't mean I'm better than you now. Listen to me. He says, instead of continuing with two groups of people separated by centuries of animosity and suspicion, he created a new kind of human being, a fresh start for everyone. So everyone say, I'm a fresh piece of canvas. Piece of canvas. Say it again. I'm a fresh piece of canvas. When, I receive, when you receive Christ, God gave you a new opportunity to start over because of the things he wants you to do. Let's go to the next scripture. Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. That's plain enough, isn't it? You're no longer wandering exiles. This, this is so good here. 
Oh my goodness. This kingdom of faith is now your home country. So it doesn't matter what country you are part of now. In the kingdom, what God is trying to get us all to see as a masterpiece, that as long as I depend on him, I have to live by faith. Because faith is the only way that I can function in the country that I'm from. You are from heaven. You landed in Texas. But now that I'm from the country, that means that in my country, I have to operate according to the rules and regulations in my country. So Jesus is saying that you are a person of this country and everything you do is by faith. This is why Jesus told a lot of the individuals that was following him, go two by two, but don't take no money. Don't take anything. Just go. Why? Because in the lifestyle we're living now, my vision will always be bigger than my pocket. And if my vision is always bigger than my pocket, I have to be able to move by faith and knowing that I'm from this country, that everything I need, because I'm locked to what God wants me to do, is going to be automatically added to me. I don't have to hustle. I don't have to pray. I don't have to beg. I don't have to sweat. You just walk through life because you are from this home country. You are no longer strangers or outsiders. You belong here with as much right to the name Christian or kingdom citizens as anyone. God is building a home, not a physical home. He's building a system that's already in place. Listen to me. He's using who? Us all. Us all, irrespective of how we got here. So it don't matter how you got here. It don't matter if you're from the south side, the east side, the west side, the broke side, the rich side. We all are here in what he's building. He's used the apostles and the prophets for the foundation. What's the foundation? Now he's using you, fitting you in brick by brick. So if you ever looked at anyone one who's laying bricks, there's no brick that's alike. But they're shaped alike because of their foundation. Right. I think I missed it. Every brick has imperfect indications in it. But the ultimate goal that every imperfect brick will end up making a beautiful home. But every single brick that's in the house has its own capacity and responsibility to uphold the foundation of their home. And so Jesus is saying that I'm fitting you in brick by brick, stone by stone, with Christ Jesus as the cornerstone that holds all the parts together. We see, not physically, but with our spiritual eyes, is taking shape day by day. So this is key. If you're not seeing that the things that's taking place right now, that God is orchestrating our world right now, day by day, Step by step, brick by brick, stone by stone. This is the ultimate plan, Holy Spirit, what God is doing with the church at this moment. Yeah. A lot of people are counting the church out, but they don't know that the church has been forced to be more innovative than we've ever been before. And now we're reaching more people than we've ever reached because we were so focused on being in the building. But God has forced us to get out of the four walls to be more creative so that this gospel of the kingdom can be reached around. But not just the gospel, the people are being exposed and being seen as well. So now people have to come back to the church. It says this. It's taking shape day after day. A holy temple built by God. All of us built into it. A temple in which God is quite at home. So what is that temple? That temple is our bodies. The temple is who we are. So I want, you, I want to tell you this. How to be that temple and that masterpiece. I'm going to give you how many things here? One, two, three. I'm going to give you three points in reference to how to build a temple. Number one is this. We have to be mature. Ephesians 4, 1 through 3 says this. I want you to get out there and walk better yet run. On the road, God called you to travel. I don't want any of you sitting around on your hands. I'm going to drink some water on that. So if the word itself says, I don't want any of you sitting around on your hands, what does that mean? <laughs> that means we should be doing something, right? How many, people are, how many people are Christians in here? You kingdom citizens. I can't see through the lights. 
Okay, I don't see somebody raising their hand. Everybody who believes in God, raise your hand. I can't see through them lights. Those LED lights are good. Everybody or Christians, you love God in here. Everybody in here, let's see. Everybody raising their hand. I can't see all y'all. Okay, I can see y'all now. All right. So if you love God, he just said, I don't want anyone of you sitting around on your hands. How many of us are sitting on our hands now? If you love God, come on, this is this this what your Bible say. That ain't my Bible. This is what your Bible say. I don't want anyone sitting on their hands. So if I love God and there's a house of God, why am I sitting around doing nothing? Why is everybody expecting the pastor to do all the work? It ain't up to the pastor to do all the work. Paul was trying to let them know that this church here, everybody has to have a part. Jesus, in the, in the other scripture, said the old system was put away. The old system was put away because the people that was divided, they the ones were putting their hands to the plow. Now, Jesus created a new system to where everyone in the church needed to be doing something. It says this. I don't want anyone strolling off down some path that goes nowhere. And mark that you do this with humility and discipline. Not in fits and starts, but steadily. What's that? When does steadily end? It doesn't end. It keeps going. Pouring yourselves out for each other in acts of love. Alert. This is so good. I should have highlighted this. I want everybody to write this down. Because the church has an issue with this. It says, alert at noticing differences and quick at mending fences. 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 This means that if, the, if God is telling me to be alert that, that this other person might come in and might be gay. Or this other person come in and might be, may not believe what I'm in. But it ain't my responsibility to judge them in this moment. It is my responsibility to notice the difference, but keep allowing my life to become the masterpiece so that my life will shine on their life and they will be changed to be who I am. But what's taking place now is I eliminate this scripture and I don't notice the difference that I want everyone to be like me. And as soon as I want everyone to be, to think, to sleep, to sing like me, then I am the master chief and nobody is better than me. Now become powerful with the kingdom of God instead of doing what God wants me to do to other people's lives. So in order for me to be the masterpiece that God wants me to be, I have to be mature. And in maturity, I have to recognize and be alert at noticing differences and quick at mending fences. This is the reason why I love our training here, and I'm going to do it again. I'm loved, I love the fact that I trained our whole team on Bible study for 52 weeks in reference to the personality traits, the personality skills, the dominance. The reds, the blues, the yellows, the greens. Because now, the reason why we have conflict is because we haven't taken the time to alert ourselves at noticing the different personalities. So the church comes from different people, different faucets, different thoughts, different mentalities, different backgrounds, different religions. Some people want me to preach. Ha! Ha! I want to learn how to do that. I just don't know how to do it. I ain't, I ain't come up like that. I need me somebody to pray, so I at least pray. Ha, ha, yeah. Mm, ha. I want to love the Lord. Ha. I want to do that because y'all black people like that. I'm like, I can't do that. I need to learn how to do it. I, I, I know he's good. I need to learn how to do it. But alert and noticing differences. Being different is okay. Different preaching styles, okay. Different churches, is okay. But we have to know that we have to be mature and that we all are God's masterpiece and we should flow together. Man, I'm going to learn how to do that for real. Ha. I know he's good. Mm, Ephesians 4 and 1 and 3. Oh, that sounds like Jodeci. <laughs> that sounds like Jodeci. <laughs> that sounds like Jodeci versus preaching. Mm, feel all of your things. <laughs> All right, all right, number two, y'all a trip. <laughs> flush it out. So everybody say, flush it out. Flush it it's so good to be back in church. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24 says this. Since then, Jesus, this is, I put this in the emphasis, Jesus teaching. We do not have the excuse, oh, this is so good. 
we do not have the excuse of ignorance. This is why I don't teach sin, sin messages. Because you know you're doing wrong. I ain't got to tell you sinning. I ain't got to tell you you fell, you fell into temptation. We all have temptations. We all have things we deal with. So I ain't got to tell you that. Oh, yeah, all of us messed up, messed up this week, right? Raise your hand if you didn't. Oh, oh, oh y'all perfect. Y'all raise your hand because you didn't. Everybody messed up. So we do not have the excuse of ignorance. Everything, and I do mean everything, connected with that old way of life has to go. So I have to flush out my old way of life. That means that in order for me to be a masterpiece for God, for the kingdom of God, I have to flush out the old things. It's rotten through and through. Get rid of it. And then take on an entirely new way of life, a God fashioned life. A life renewed from the inside. Listen, from the inside. It ain't safe from the outside in. I can't judge nobody out and then try to fix myself. I got to fix myself and then the outside will pour and penetrate on somebody else's life. So it says this. A life renewed from the inside and working itself into your conduct as God accurately reproduces his character in you. So this is every single day. It is not just once a year, every once in a while when I receive. No, this is every single day. So in order to be a masterpiece, number two, I have to flush it out. Number one, I have to be mature. Number three is this. Tell the freaking truth. Tell the freaking truth. We have too many people in the church that's lying. How are you today? Blessed and highly favored. You lying. <laughs> you and your husband just had a big fallout last night. <laughs> Tell the truth. It's too many people in the church. We're hiding things, but we come to church and we, <laughs> I'm so blessed. I'm highly favored. But you're struggling with stress every day because your children are acting crazy. Come on. You preaching today. You just got through taking down the fifth of Henderson because you're stressed out. And you're a church smelling like it. I'm good. You're not good. You are not good. Stop lying. The only way we can properly pray for you and assist you is by you telling the truth. The families are broken because we're not telling the truth. Listen to this. Ephesians 4, 25 to 27. What this adds up to then is this. No more lies. No more pretests. Tell your neighbor the truth. You don't like the fact that your neighbor let the dog poop in your yard. Tell them. In Christ's body, we are all connected to each other. After all, when you lie, oh, this is good, to others, you end up lying to yourself. You know you hurt. I'm blessed to have the fact you lie. Now you lie to yourself. You look in the mirror telling yourself this, and now you start believing it. If I start telling everybody this church is really, this, this chair is white, eventually somebody's going to believe it. Verse 26 to 27. Go ahead and be angry. Be mad. Be mad. It's okay to be mad. You made me mad. I'm good. It says you do well to be angry. So allow it out. Everybody say allow it out. Just be angry. Not and say punch the, and kick the dog. But find a way. It's okay to be angry. We act like we church folks and we don't ever get angry. We get angry too. If you don't believe it, go and read when Jesus saw them in the temple selling stuff. Go read it. If you don't think Jesus get angry, you remember when Jesus said, uh, they gone, he looked at the 12 side, but you going to go too? Go. <laughs> Jesus got mad. Come on, man. I'm praying for y'all all night. Man, can y'all at least pray for y'all sleep and all this? What, what y'all doing? Right. Come on, tell the truth. Paul was a gangster. Paul was like, uh, uh, what was it, Mark? Who, who, who Paul didn't want to go with him? Go with him. Uh, Tim no, he wasn't Timothy. Mark, he was like, no, because you can't roll with me. You always turned me down one time. Most Christians were like, oh, come on, I'm going to forgive him, come out with him. No, you turned your back on me when I was in the hood. Yeah. 
I was in the valley about to fight and you turned your back. No, you ain't going with me over here. Stay, go somewhere else. Because I can't trust you no more. We, okay, let me keep moving. That was for somebody. You do well to be angry, but don't use your anger to fuel for revenge. Now we wrong when we start taking revenge. The word says vengeance is mine. It's okay to be angry, but we got to be able to resolve the situation faster. Listen to this. And don't stay angry. Don't go to bed angry. That just ain't, listen, that's not just about your husband and your wife. If I get mad at Chris, my responsibility is to make sure before that song go down, me and Chris get it right. That ain't, some people use that just for marriage content. It ain't just about husband and wife. If I get mad at my sister, my brother, it is my responsibility to, oh, my brother, boo, what, Antonio, come up here. Antonio, run, hurry up. <laughs> Example. Turn around. Look at everybody. We look alike. He's sexy, too. Look at him. <laughs> I remember, and I can tell a story of him. My brother, Maxim Lord, he, bro, he here with me in town. I've been praying for him to be in the same town to come help us with the church. But I remember on the same day my grandmother died. Listen to me. We were all, I'm, about to, I'm not going to cry. I'll hold it. We were all in the room. I ain't going to cry. And we got into it, remember? But because I knew this, I chased him all the way down the street port and followed him in the store. I said, bro, we got to get this right. Because I don't know if I leave and something happened to my brother or something happened to me and one of us got to live with this for the rest of our life. So we left Monroe. We were angry. I was peed off at him. He was peed off at me. We were really mad at each other. But I knew this word. And I said, you know what? Before I leave Monroe, I got to get it right. I don't think you answered my call for the first couple of calls, did you? I just kept calling. I'm going to keep blowing your phone. Listen, I'm going to keep blowing your phone up, baby. If I had the location, I'm going to follow you where you're at. Because I know that as a pastor and as a man of God, I got to get this right. Because if I don't get this right, I'm not worried about my relationship with him. I'm worried about my relationship with the Father. Because I know that what God has for my life as a masterpiece, somebody's going to shine this light on me. And I cannot preach forgiveness for somebody else if I'm not practicing it, even with my own family. So it's so many families that are broken up now because they don't understand this principle. They only think it's for husband and wives. But you have a brother and a sister that you are not fixing things with. So therefore, the church, we are so mixed up because we can't fix these things here because we are too prideful to allow things to be resolved because the word tells us clearly, don't go to bed angry. This is the key why. This is why so many families are broken up now. Don't give the devil that kind of foothold in your life because the devil will make it seem like he don't like me and I ain't going to call him. You shouldn't call him first. Let him call you. You're the big brother. You, the devil will play with your mind all in your dreams. You will wake up mad because you did not follow this principle. Do not go to bed angry. Don't give the devil that kind of foothold in your life. That's somebody. Make some noise, my brother. Thank you, man. So again, Tell freaking truth. Next one, that mouth. Somebody say, I want to put D-A-T, that mouth. Ephesians 4, 25 through 27 says this. Watch the way you talk. Watch the way you talk. Let nothing foul or dirty come out of your mouth. Watch this key. As kingdom citizens, the only way things can take place in the kingdom of God is that we have to begin to decree it out of our mouths. I stated earlier this year that 5780 is Hebrewic for God stating that whatever I state out of my mouth, he's going to allow the manifestation to be. So the enemy knows that there are a lot of ignorant kings on this earth that saying things out of their mouth that's creating a world that they have to live in because it was developed from their mouth. So the reason why... Ephesians 4, 25 to 27 says this because everything you stated out of your mouth, it creates the life that you are in right now. Watch the way you talk. Let nothing foul or dirty come out of your mouth. Say only what helps. Each word a gift. Verse 30. Don't grieve God. Say it to yourself. So I, I'm, say, God, forgive me for grieving you. Don't break his heart. 
All of us have broken God's heart. But how do we break his heart when we don't love each other? His Holy Spirit moving and breathing in you is the most intimate part of your life, making you fit for him. Let's not skip over the word fit. If I'm going to run a triathlon, what do I have to do? I have to get in shape. So the reason why the word tells us to do this every single day, because I have to get my body in shape to be the masterpiece that God wants me to be. That's spiritually and physically. Some of us eat the wrong things all the time. And when God finally allow us to reach our purpose, we got to spend everything we've done on hospital bills because we're not taking care of our health. So we have to make sure that we are physically fit and spiritually fit for himself. Don't take such a gift for granted. Make a clean break with all cutting, backbiting, profound talk. Be gentle with one another. Be gentle and sensitive with one another. If I have a brother and sister that's at art, they're angry. I have to be sensitive to one another. Forgive one another as quickly and thoroughly, thoroughly, whatever the word says, as God in Christ forgave you. So sometimes we forget my music should be playing. I'm at 35 more. I know I'm past 35 now. So when we are at a point of our lives to where we forget to forgive one another as quickly as God did in Christ and forgave you, then we begin to forget that we were once in the same position as the person that needs forgiveness. And I want all of us to represent God as a masterpiece. So everybody stand to your feet real quick. Turn it down for me just a little bit. I want everyone for a second. I want you to look inside your own spirit. I want you to look inside your own mind. And I want you to Think about the last person. You can cut it up just a little bit. Think about the last person that offended you or that you offended. And I want you to begin to send them love. I want you to say, God, forgive me for ever thinking like this. God, forgive me for not forgiving them. Forgive me for holding on and going to sleep on this and going against your word. So I want to give you 30 seconds to send the person that offended you love. And I want you to walk in forgiveness for the rest of your life because God wants all of us to be masterpieces but we should be a masterpiece that people sees God in because to be honest with you sometimes God would people would never see God but only through you and so you have to always remember that I, if I'm God's masterpiece I have to look exactly and be designed the way that God has orchestrated me before I was born the word says that before you were in the womb, I knew you. That means you are already perfectly made. So for 30 seconds, I want you to forgive yourself first. Forgive the person that offended you. And if it hasn't been made right, I want you to make it right today. So that God can give you exactly what you need in the moment and in the midst of COVID-19 and social injustice. Because God needs the church. People need the church. And in order for us to be in position to expand what God wants us to do, we have to make sure our lives are clean. So 30 seconds. Amen. I want everybody to say this, and I want you to say this with boldness. I want you to begin today to see yourself the way God sees you, and I want you to say this with some power and might. We have to get this brain wrinkle in our minds, in our spirit, so that you wake up every morning believing this. Say, I am acceptable. I am, acceptable. I am, lovable. I am lovable. I am forgivable. 
I am valuable. I am capable. I am acceptable. I am lovable. I am forgivable. I am valuable. I am capable. One more time. I am acceptable. I am lovable. I am forgivable. I am valuable. And I am capable. If you believe that, make some noise for the king. Make some noise for the king. I have three invitations I want to give you. First invitation online. If you need anyone to pray with you today, our online audience, we now have someone that's over intercessory prayer. Online, I want somebody to type this online. If you need prayer today within the next 20 minutes, I want you to call this number. 81-762-7364. Again, if you need prayer, I want you to call this number. This is the number to the church. Because I know that we have people online that need to receive salvation and forgiveness. This number again is 281-762-7364. One more time, I'm going to give you to you again. The number is 281. Put it in the message area. Somebody type it in the comments area. 762-7374. If they got it, I want you to be able to call this number if you need prayer. We have prayer partners that are standing by waiting for you to call. And as they are praying with you, if you haven't received salvation or any of these that I'm giving you now, I'm giving you a number to call. So my first invitation is this. You may say, Dr. A, I heard your word. I'm not right with Christ. He's not my Lord. But after today, I want to align my life up to receive Christ as my Savior. Invitation number two is this. I used to walk with Christ, but I end up losing my way. The scripture stated that if I'm not aligned with Christ, I end up losing my way. I was that person. So I want to come back home. And invitation number three, whether you're online or physically, you might say, I've been looking for a church home for too long. I was a part of a church where something happened. COVID-19 broke everything up. But I want to be a part of this movement and a part of this revelation and a part of this revolution that's happening right now in our church. So if any one of those three invitations are for you, either I want you to send a comment on Facebook or I want you to come down this aisle so I can pray with you at this moment. And I'm going to give 60 seconds as the music is playing. Playing. All right, make some noise for our king. Make some noise for our king. If you had a, if you enjoyed that teaching, make some noise for our king. Let's go into our confession. We can keep this music playing. I think my confession's here. Let's stand to our feet. Let's say our confession together that we can get out of here. Confessions again for this house. It's the more I can get you to say great things out of your mouth, the more I can get you to create the life that God has for you. So let's say our confession. One, two, three, let's go. I'm the righteous of God. Through the blood of Jesus. Therefore, I'm blessed and favor surrounds me as a shield. I have favor with God and man today, all day long. People go out of their way to. I have God preferential treatment. God loves me and He likes me. I'm increasing in wisdom today. I'm more than a conqueror in every situation that comes my way. Good things happen to me because I'm successful in everything I do. Because I favor my life. I'm a delightful people. They enjoy me and take pleasure in being around me. I have favor my relationships, favor my marriage, favor my home, favor my job, favor my business, favor at school, favor in the ministry, favor in overcoming hindrances. The Lord is in me and with me. Everywhere I go today, I'm the live out of every distress and affliction. Everyone I meet sees I have goodwill, favor, wisdom, and understanding because of the Spirit of God living in me. Say, I will have life now. Two more times. One more time. Father, I thank you for blessing your people on this day. 
I thank you that I've done my job as your son, as a pastor of this church, as a friend, as a brother. I thank you that this word pierced our heart and we will absorb it. We will run with it and we will not utilize the excuse anymore of not being the masterpiece that you have created us to be. I bless their week. We bless our children as they're going to school. Those that are going to school at home, those that are going to school physically. I plead the blood of Jesus over their lives, the college students, the young adults, those that are going back to work physically. I thank you that you're blessing their lives and that we will continue not to have a case of COVID-19 in this church. I thank you that no life will be lost because of COVID-19 in this church. So I utilize the power as we utilize our faith to Together, as a kingdom house, as a church of God, no one will get sick, no one will go without because we have been meant to be the example and the masterpiece on this earth. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth just like it is in heaven through us as your kingdom ambassadors. In Jesus' name we pray. Make some noise for the king. Y'all have a blessed week. Love you all. We can bring the lights up. Y'all have an excellent week. <laughs>